Perfect. So you're going to talk to us uh, today about a Python, the transition from Python 2 to Python 3, right? Yes. Mm, okay. Perfect. And are you ready to start then? I'm ready. Wonderful. So, uh, Michael Howitt, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my presentation. We have nearly 1 million lines of Python 2 code in production and now. In summer 2016, we started to think about this question. I'm going to present how we solved this problem and what you can learn for your own big and small Python 2 migration projects. Let me start by introducing myself. Oh, I see this is an, a bit older photo. Well, since, I am, since 2003, I am a Python software developer. I was the head of development in the Python migration project my presentation is based on. My employer is a small software and consulting company named Gosept. It is located in Halle, Germany. We do not have own products we sell, but we develop and maintain projects for our customers. Currently, we work on some migration projects, migrating them to Python 3 or we even have finished the migration. I'd like to say thank you to GoSEP for the time to prepare and to give this talk. Now you know a little bit about me, let me ask a single question to you. I took this question from the Python 2 end of life survey done by Active State in the last quarter of 2019. So, uh, the question might sound a bit off now, but uh, nevertheless, the question is how prepared do you feel for Python 2 end of life? There should be uh, an, uh, a button to answer this survey for you in the Zoom. So let's try it. Ah, I can answer the question myself, that's nice. Yeah. yeah, we have 48% of the of the attendees voted so far. Fifty percent. Come on, pips. It's twenty eight of you that haven't voted yet. 27. Okay, so I'll try to present the results of the survey and then we can compare with the results of the poll. The results of the survey. No. The results of the survey were that about half of the participants felt highly prepared but about a third did not feel prepared at all. So ah, I do not see the results of the, of the poll. No, but so far we have 27% not prepared, 45% somewhat prepared, and 27% highly prepared. Okay, that's even less than the survey results, at least the, the ones who are highly prepared. So the end of life of Python 2 is already history. If you do not feel well enough prepared to handle that event, let's see what this presentation can give you. I scheduled the following four items for you. Discussion of approaches, introduction into Union CMS as I use it as an example project for the presentation, doing the migration and tips and tricks. Let's dive into a discussion about possible approaches. What to do with an application running on Python 2. Discussion here means that I am the only one who discusses, sorry. I'm going to present the following five approaches. Sunset's application replaced by something off the shelf. Don't migrate, start over or fade out and move to Python 3. Let's start with the first approach. Python 2 is after its end of life, maybe your presentation too. Ask yourself, how important is the business case 
the application supports. How long will I or my company earn money using this business case? Can a migration be a success even financially? This approach might be the cheapest and the most safe one, if it is possible at all. But you should at least think about it. Don't burn money by touching an application which is no, not or no longer worth investing into it. Is your application so special that it cannot be replaced? Maybe you can even replace it by something off the shelf. It is probably cheaper to buy a service from a company than doing everything yourself. Yes, I know there was a time when it was totally cool to write your own tools. Nowadays, there are lots of specialized service providers who can do a better job. If you want to keep your tool, it's your baby and you have to take care of it. On the other hand, you mostly get only an 80% solution. Maybe you can work around the missing 20%. One of our customers, for instance, is replacing big parts of their homegrown ERP system by products backed by companies, the bug tracker, the internal CMS, uh, the calendar, and so on. You still have to migrate the data. I know this can cause big trouble, but you only do have to do it once. After the migration of the data, the problem of the, it is a problem of the service provider, the task of the service provider to keep the service running, to fulfill feature requests. They have to take the maintenance burden. Your users might need to learn a new tool. They might require some customizations, but being forced to tell the user the new application cannot do this, let's find a way around it, might cause less stress than having to ask, when do you need this new feature? Even my company, the company I work for, as a software shop, has a slogan which roughly translates into English, better buy it instead of develop it on your own. The next approach might be dangerous. Don't migrate. My boss won't like that I mention this approach here because it could ruin our business. Or save it if you are forced to change your mind in two years. If the use case of your application will go away soon, neither maintenance nor development of new features is required. And if there are no bugs to fix, this approach might be a fit for you. But be careful, don't use this approach on critical infrastructure, which ran for years and nobody wants to take care of. What will happen if the server running the application dies? Okay. It won't be a problem. It runs in a, in a virtual machine or in a Docker container, but does it really? Will you able to find help if you have problems with the code within the next two years? So be aware it will become harder to keep an old application running and to find someone who wants to invest time into it, even if you have the money. If it is all ruins, maybe start over. There are uh, uh, directly in Python 3 or even in another language. Try to keep at least the high level tests so you do not have everything from scratch. There are many people who say, don't do this. And I am one of them. It might be interesting to start on new ground. In the beginning, it looks like a great opportunity to do everything correct this time like you read it in the book. Often uh, this will become a great nightmare, at least for big enough projects. You can do this for a microservice, but not for a monolith application. There might be exceptions to this rule of thumb, but why do you think you are the exception? Rewrite projects are the ones which rarely succeed. Only rewriting is never enough. The new application should also be a lot more flexible and have a ton of new features. And you still have to migrate the data. Or do you dare to use the same old database? During the rewrite, the old code still has to be maintained. Change requests now have to be implemented in both variants, the old one and the new one. 
you have to learn the use cases which led to the former application again, or do you have up-to-date requirements documentation? Users will not be happy with a new application. It's always <laughs> the, the kind because it behaves differently. The old one they used to complain about will over time become the secret weapon to get things done. The minimal viable product for the new application will be quite big, especially as there is an old working one the users know and trust. There is a sub approach to start over named fade out. Replace the parts of the old monolith one by one. This might work, but wouldn't be it easier if the monolith already runs on a recent Python version? So you do not have to think in different Python versions if you have to work both on the monolith and on the on its successor. If nothing helps, you could even try to move your code and your tests to Python 3. For me, this is the most interesting approach because I love legacy code. I admire the people who created it and it can uh, and if I can make it even better, it would be a great opportunity. Of all the approaches I showed you, this one I think is the most future proof. It uses <clears throat> what's already running in production and only transforms it. It can be challenging, but until now it was possible for each project we touched as a company. Let me introduce Union CMS. Union CMS is a content management system once written for Verdi, a German trade union. Its first version went into production as early as 2003. It's now also used by DGB, also known as Deutsche Gewerkschaftsbund. Union CMS is a multi-site, multi-user content management system. It has thousands of content editors and it serves it's content to some million visitors. Sorry, the source code is not publicly available. When we first touched uh, the source code in 2009, it was based on ZOAP2 and the ZOAP object database, ZODB. It was probably running Python 2.6, as Python 2.7 was not yet finally released those days. Over the years, we developed many new features for the CMS. So finally, we ended up having nearly 1 million lines of Python code together in the core of the CMS and in the projects using the CMS, which are built on top of the core. The customers are interested to keep this CMS running and maintainable for the next coming years. So there was no way to sunset the application. Do not migrate was also a no-go because of security considerations. Replacing it or starting over was no opportunity. The customers invested much time and effort in the previous years to train the editors and to create or migrate the content from an older Union CMS version. So we were happy to migrate the core and the projects built upon Union CMS to Python 3. Now let's take a look at the migration steps which worked well for Union CMS. I believe they can be used in a Python 3 migration projects of any size. I'm going to present four, five, five main steps. Step one of the migration is general preparation. This means have someone who knows Python 2 and Python 3 and the differences in between. There are enough tutorials on uh, the web, so I'm not going uh, to cover this here. It deeply helps to have a decent test coverage. Yes, this means you have to part the tests too, but the test coverage gives you confidence that your code still runs. In Union CMS, we currently have about 88% test coverage of the Python code. 
when we started, Union CMS had less test coverage. It increased during the migration project. Sorry, I do not have the actual numbers from where we started. Currently, the 88% are quite good enough. Annotating each function with the expected types for the input and the output, aka uh, type annotations, might help. Checkers like MyPy are able to find problems by statically analyzing your code. But in Python 2, type annotations have to be comments instead of being part of the language. So in Union CMS, we decided against using type annotations for the migration. It seemed too much hassle for an unknown gain. Step two of the migration. Clean up code and test. This means all tests should be running and passing. Broken or disabled tests are generally no good idea. You should try to fix them or delete them if nothing helps. Some parts of the code are probably unused. You should not port them. The ones used will be difficult enough to port. So there's no need to work on dead code. In Union CMS, it required a lot of detective work to find code which is no longer needed. There were Python modules which were not even imported, so they had no PyC files. There were classes and functions which were not used anywhere. We had the advantage to know the code base relatively well to find that dead code, or at least hopefully most of it. There was a presentation on this on this conference about deleting uh, the joy of deleting code, I think it was called. So there are, in this talk, you can find ideas how to find and delete this that code. Removing that code should be done like surgeon, symbol by symbol, function by function, class by class. Remove everything the dead code needs, the imports, the global variables, the registration, etc. Each deleted line does not need to be ported and supported later on. Step three of the migration is bring uh, dependencies to Python 3. That means you need a list of all the direct and transitive Python package dependencies of your application. Transitive dependencies are the dependencies of the dependencies and the dependencies of the dependencies of the dependencies, you know it. How to get this list depends on the tools you use. Only two examples, if you're using pip to install your dependencies, call pip freeze to get this list. Union CMS uses ZC build out. It lists all the needed dependencies in the generate run scripts. So we got them from there. Each dependency has to be checked for Python 3 compatibility individually. This means Take a look at the Python package index, aka PyPI, for the package and see if there is a version which declares Python 3 support. I know this step could be automated, but looking at the package gives you a feeling for the package. When was the latest release? Does the package still seem to be actively developed and maintained? Which version is the last one which supports both Python 2 and Python 3? On the next slide, I'm going to suggest to port to Python 3 by keeping Python 2 compatibility at least for a while. So you need to know this version. This step, step could also be used to introspect the stack you're all building upon. Possibly you will find packages which should be replaced or have a maintained successor package. At the end of the step, you have a snapshot of the versions you're using the package versions needed for Python 3 compatibility and a maximum package version maximum package version numbers to keep for Python 2 compatibility. When uh, you know the needed versions, you can use them. Make sure you run on the newest versions which are Python 2 compatible. This might require some changes in your code, so it works with this, these newer versions. This, of course, also means run on the latest version of Python 2.7. I think it's Python 2.7.18, which was released uh, 
the CO. There might be uh, dependencies which are not yet ported to Python 3. You could try to replace them with other packages. According to the already cited active state survey, finding replacement packages, more than half of the participants of the survey expected this to be a challenge in the migration. Sometimes you are the chosen one to port a package to Python 3. You could see that as an exercise for the migration of your application. Maybe it's even enough to port the parts of the package you actually use. To get a clear plan where to start porting your application, you might need a dependency tree of the packages belonging to the application. It should at least exist in your head. The packages without the dependencies, the packages with circular dependencies, which need to be ported together, at least the interdependent parts, and the packages which need the whole core to be ported before. In Union CMS, we knew the dependencies well enough, so there was no need for an explicit dependency graph. Unfortunately, so I cannot suggest a good tool for creating that dependency tree. There might be one which I used more than once. It's called TLACDEPS, but it might not fit your use case. Let's move to step four, migrate the code. There are several tools to help you. Modernize is a package created by Armin Ronacher, the developer of Flask and many other Python packages. It is used to convert Python 2 code so it can run both on Python 2 and on Python 3. To achieve this goal, it adds a dependency to a library named 6, as 2 times 3 is 6. Depending on this 6 library makes it pretty easy to drop Python 2 support later on as the code needed for compatibility is marked by using this library. You only have to grab for six. Although this step automatically changes the code, we had very little problems with the changes it created. We were happy about this first step running automatically as it was clear the next ones would require manual work. There is an alternative to modernize called Futurize. It adds a dependency to a library named Future. I personally do not like this library. It seems not as lightweight as 6, which provides only a single module. Future has many modules, and when looking at the imports, uh, you're not always sure. Are you importing from standard library, or are you importing from the Future library? It feels like future is not made as a temporary dependency, which will be removed after the migration with ease. There are some problems which cannot be automatically fixed, but they can be detected. For instance, in Python 3, a class providing the method dunder eq for equality comparison has also to implement dunder hash. PyLint is a tool to find such issues. It has a mode where you can detect them. You need to install PyLint, a PyLint version older than version 2 on Python 2, because newer versions are Python 3 only and no longer contain the needed checkers. It will tell you about some problems that even your tests will not find but they can cause trouble when running the application. And now the heavy lifting follows. Run the tests on Python 3 and fix them until they pass. There might be even import errors which already disturb the test collection. Many of them will be due to relative imports which are no longer support on Python 3. Running the tests will show up all the problems Modernize and PyLint could not find, for instance, string IO versus bytes IO. And if you did from Dunder Future import Unicode literals and need both in both Python versions native strings, you are forced to remove this 
feature future future switch ask a web engine of your choice a web search engine of your choice for specific problems you encounter there are already solutions for most of them i added two example pages in the links section on the last page of the presentation if you are using pytest to run your tests the plugin pytest current 10 can come handy it allows to curate a list of failing tests this way you always know which text tests you still have to fix and you see if you broke tests by your changes which were successful before you uh, are even able to commit the quarantine list to your repository so multiple developers can work on fixing the tests make sure the test still pass on python 2 so you are always able to deploy to production in union cms it was really helpful to add comments to the code branches which are only needed by a single python version which are, which are specific for a python version by sharp py2 respectively sharp py3 this uh, made it easier later on to remove python2 compatibility code which was not uh, had, had nothing to do with uh, the six library okay step five switch to python3 this means run your application instance against an at least fairly empty database this way you make sure the instance starts at least sometimes uh, we already had it in our company the tests run fine but the instance didn't start you might find some uh, unicode with spikes issues while clicking through the application maybe you should write some additional tests for the problems you find when uh, the application runs it might be time to migrate the, migrate the data union cms uses the odb this database stores python pickle objects python uh, pickle objects behave differently on python 2 and python 3 if you store an object with an instance of still on python 2 it can have an arbitrary encoding as it is actually bytes data but if you read this picker on python 3 it is expects uh, the data to be utf utf8 encoded as it expects ta still to contain text data so you have to convert this these pickers if you are using a relational database you are probably lucky and able to skip this step now you can uh, deploy the application to a staging environment to test it in depth from end to end even uh, with 100 percent test coverage some issues might slip through union cms was tested by the editors who use it in their day job they even wrote a test manual for an external tester to test the cms on the different installations because it was too tedious for them to do this be aware that the testers will find bugs the automatic tests did not find additionally they will find bugs which already existed before the python 3 migration was started you have to think uh, what how to deal with them after a successful test on staging it's time to roll out to production maybe you can do a canary rollout this means let only a small fraction of your users hit the server running on python 3 fix the occurring errors and then increase the portion of users which see the python 3 version uh, over time up to 100 percent in union cms this approach was not possible as i said we had to convert the database to be usable on Python 3, so it was no longer usable on Python 2. So we stopped editing in the CMS for a weekend and converted a copy of the database and went back online after the conversion. The rollout went smooth thanks to the many testers in the staging environment. There is one final step, drop the Python 2 support. 
an application can only run on a single Python version. After the successful development on Python 3, the Python 2 compatibility code is no longer needed. The code branches for checking for the Python versions might cause at least some performance. Most of them will be done on import time, but some of them have to be done in run runtime. And comments in the code about specific Python versions might distract the developers. It seems to be the best way to drop Python support in a coordinated way instead of when using, when editing the code the next time it is touched. There's a tool called PyUpgrade, which can be used to remove most parts where the library six is used. So this can be done automatically. Additionally, it converts, it is able to convert code to be modern Python 3, including the usage of F strings. After running this tool, you can remove the imports of six, which it does not do automatically, at least not the version we used. And you can clean up the places you might have marked with Py2 or Py3, as I suggested. Do not underestimate the step. Even reading through the diff when removing Python 2 compatibility is a lengthy task. Don't forget to update the dependencies to the newest Python 3 only versions. Some words about the time schedule. We use the following metrics to compute the effort for porting Union CMS to Python 3. We at first ran Python modernize and afterwards pylands with PyLint without checking in the changes. For each warning PyLint showed, we calculated 30 minutes to fix it because these are the hard things. In most cases, we needed less than the calculated 30 minutes. For each doc test we had, we calculated 20 minutes because some tests had to be rewritten as unit tests to support both Python versions and to understand them. And <laughs> we knew this from uh, previous projects. Uh, the tests, uh, these tests, which have to be, had to be converted to unit tests took more than the 20, calculated 20 minutes. We calculated five minutes for each Python module, including the test modules, and two minutes for each Python module Python modernized had touched to maybe fix the mess the tool created. Plus, 135 minutes as a base effort per installable Python package. This means a package with a setup.py, which can be installed via pip. These numbers added up to a budget, which was more than enough to migrate the code. We created a plan for the whole migration. We planned 19 working phases, one iteration each month, with two weeks of implementation and testing. So there was still time for bug fixes and new features outside the migration project because we, the customer and we did not want to, to stop everything only for this migration. Be aware, this 19 working phases were not only the migration from Python 2 to Python 3, but we also migrated from ZOAP to 13 to ZOAP 4 as the underlying main dependency as the application server. Additionally, we fixed some technical debt as we are working on the code. And actually, we deployed a version running on Python 3 after the 15th iteration. So we were a bit faster than expected. We uh, originally planned to roll out after each iteration, so after each month, but the customer was not able to test the whole CMS that often because they did not trust our automatic tests so much. So we had a rollout every three months. Each rollout was shipping the current status of the Python 3 migration as it was still Python 2 compatible. Even uh, the big first rollout on Python 3 could have been switched back to Python 2 if it would have failed utterly on Python 3. So the bug fixes would have been deployed, but on Python 2. Now I'm going to give you some tips and lessons learned. The migration project might take a while. 
So aim to use a recent Python 3 version. So you do not have to start the next small migration project the day after the rollout. Python 3.7 seems to be a good starting point. Newer Python versions might make it a bit harder to still support Python 2. There are discussions to, uh, to keep it easier to run on a newer Python 3 versions, but it might be a problem. Merge oftener to the main branch. So do not have, do not use long, long running branches. I suggested that your code will run on Python 2 and Python 3. So there's no need to keep it separate from the main branch as it produces enough <laughs> new problems. Go the route of the small steps. Your project might seem small enough to directly migrate to Python 3 without the intermediate steps of supporting both versions, as I suggested. But we did this on a project, on a seemingly small project, and we got burned. The changes of the updating the dependencies to Python 3 together with the uh, the update to Python 3 of the code were too much to get it running. So we had to step back, uh, port to the new versions, and then analyze the problems in Python 2 as we knew uh, this was a running version which was running before. And then we could port again to Python 3. So it cost at least time and money. The Python 3 migration of Union CMS took about one and a half years. It could have been done in a much shorter time, but we wanted to be sure that it was always in the deployable state and features and bug fixes were always possible during the whole migration project without breaking what we already achieved in the migration projects pro, pro, process. If you are still running Python 2.7 or even older in production, it should not matter if you keep doing so for some extra month to gain the extra certainty, the migration will not break everything into pieces. That's all. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and have some nice takeaways for your own projects. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to share the re result of the polls. So I just finished now and we have 38% on somewhat prepared, 38% on highly prepared and 24% on not prepared. So I think our audience is a little bit different from the, the, the one we showed in the beginning. There we go. You can have a look at the, the results now. Okay, and thank you. No problem at all. And then we also have a question from Ivan. So Ivan is asking, how would you balance the involvement of QA people, QA engineers, testers, test automation engineers, during the process of rewriting the service application? How would you find the right balance between enough test validation without, show, without slowing the overall progress, but avoiding the typical scenario of leaving all the testing to the end? Okay, that's an interesting question. Uh, we were a team of about five people, so we did not have such uh, many uh, uh, job titles. Uh, and the, the idea was to test each step uh, automatically and by uh, the customers. So, uh, there was no, no QA team. Uh, so we are not such a big company, so I do not have any experience uh, how this uh, would work in a bigger scenario. Perfect, very good. Uh, and then we had Andy asking, is there any tools for adding tests for otherwise untested microservices? A tool which automatically writes tests. That's, that that's would, that's would be nice uh, to, to have such a tool. Uh, there are ideas. Uh, 
I think there's even a, a, a talk on this conference about uh, how tests write nearly write themselves. I didn't attend it, so uh, the, the 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 way you can do it, you can uh, use the code and write. Uh, tests for the expected uh, values and for the, the code branches, especially for the, the, the happy paths, and then uh, maybe add some uh, for uh, error handling. Perfect, thank you. Then uh, David is asking, did you want any automatic tools on the complete code base and then hand out the parts to fix as work items? Or did you run it file by file as work items? Uh, we ran it on each package. Union CMS has about uh, 30 uh, pip installable packages, and we ran the automatic tools on each package. There are some which are quite big, so it took a relatively long time uh, to run them, read through the diff, and commit it, but uh, it worked relatively well. Perfect, cool. And then last question for now, I think, yes, uh, is from Keith. So how did you prioritize developer time between new feature development or bug fixes as opposed to the effort on the migration? Was the pressure from management to pause or delay your work on the migration for business reasons? Uh, we prioritized by uh, blocking uh, uh, weeks in the calendar for doing the migration. So uh, the idea was to have the migration at, at the beginning of the month so that the other weeks are free uh, for uh, bug fixing and development. And uh, we did not feel uh, too much pressure to delay the migration because uh, it was important for the customer to, to get this, to get sure they are running on a secure environment, which uh, is updated to uh, the current uh, Python versions, which uh, they wanted for uh, security considerations. Perfect. And that is the end then of our Q&A and also the end of your talk, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming and sharing us some thoughts on testing and, and migration from Python 2 to Python 3. Thank you. It was a pleasure. My pleasure.